So I'll just um, hold on, move to the next slide. So yeah, welcome everybody to uh, this afternoon session on Race Talk. And, and just before I start, I, I want to just say something around um, being comfortable, um, because conversations about race and racism and whiteness often evoke a sense of uncomfortableness with many people. And what I'm going to ask you to do this afternoon is please just lean into that discomfort for the next hour and, um, and engage in some of the, the presentation that I'm going to have in some conversations, I hope. And, and hopefully I will try and get you beyond some of that discomfort into a lovely space where you can begin your own journey of learning more about um, race, racism and whiteness so that you are better placed um, when you go in um, to, 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 to join your probationary year eventually. So, so folks, obviously um, this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about race and racism. So I need to set some ground rules really here and those ground rules are effectively just to say to you that this is really a space for honest and constructive discussions. And I know that we've only got just under an hour and I'm going to set myself a timer like a typical teacher here so that it keeps me right and it gives you enough time to ask some questions. But Chatham House rules will apply here, folks, this afternoon. Please just think that anything you do say at the end of the session or ask in the chat um, is, um, you know, it remains here. I know it's been recorded, so if you don't want um, your, your name or your face to appear, just keep yourself um, and your camera off, in a sense. But um, please do contribute, because that's part of the learning process. So welcoming you to the safe space and the beginning, I would say, uh, to your discussions of becoming an effective ally um, in this work. So I'm hoping, folks, that the aim that I'm hoping to do this afternoon is First, to tell you a bit, little bit about, let's hear from the young people themselves. What are their thoughts about schools in Scotland? Then I want to ask you to think about that definition of social justice, because oftentimes when I have discussions around that with, with uh, teachers, head teachers, they tend to, the focus tends to be around ASN for additional support needs or gender um, and, and, and other aspects. But race is always one that falls off the agenda. And we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, I also want you to, to have this session in a, as an opportunity to think about your personal and professional values. And that's really important going forward um, as uh, in your teacher journey. And then let's begin to think about what that might look like in your classroom. How do we begin um, to create that climate in our classroom where we're not just, at times what we're doing just now is celebrating at bed, at, you know, and I think we need to think about acknowledging and then beginning to nurture and then promote the diversity within our schools. So I'm going to start off with, just to set the context here, young people's voices around um, their four key areas, teaching and learning, achievements and successes, when things go wrong, of course, they turn to their teacher, I hope, and cultural inclusion. So this study was done by Intercultural Youth Scotland and EDI Scotland, who went out to capture young people's perceptions. Now, a lot of this work was stemmed within secondary school experiences. So um, if you are from the primary sector, please don't think this is not relevant to you. It absolutely is because of that transition from early years to primary to secondary. It's that whole uh, school trajectory that we're trying to focus on here. So I'm just going to share with you some statistics. Um, so in terms of teaching and learning, Young people were given certain statements. And the first statement they were presented was subjects taught at school reflected my life experiences as a BME person in Scotland. 53.8% disagreed with this statement. That's a huge statistic when our young people are saying, oh, I don't really see myself. You know, when I'm learning at school, I can't relate to some of the subjects that I'm, that I'm learning about or that my teacher is discussing. In English lessons, our class read books about experiences that related to my culture, heritage and background. 71.8% disagreed folks. So really telling that are we as, as teachers, as student teachers thinking about that when we are thinking about the ethos within our classrooms, um, our, our general library area, our book corner, 
um, are our young children being exposed to literature that reflects the diversity out there? So I, I remember myself and also now my own children in school um, growing up reading books where I didn't see anybody who looked like me. I wrote stories um, with, you know, with Jane and John as my key characters. I didn't read anything about Aisha or Inderpal or how ye, um, and so therefore, of course, my writing would also reflect that. Um, so let's have a think about what we're exposing our young people to or not exposing our young people to. Really important for us to think about that the learning has to be relevant. And if we draw on CFE, we're thinking about personalization and choice here in terms of the principles. So this one here about teachers made assumptions about my intelligence and abilities. So a really serious one here, folks. Um, for us to think about 60.2% of our young people agreed that their teachers will make assumptions about what they can, what they can attain, what they can achieve, their competency, right? That's a that's a hard, a high number here for us to make assumptions about young people who are, are different um, uh, from ourselves. So teachers dismissed or devalued my contributions in class with 30.7% agreed. Um, so again, really important, how do we really hear the voices, whose voices are being valued over others or whose contributions um, are we really considering when we're thinking about our teaching and learning? In terms of achievements, teachers at my school encouraged BAME students to achieve as much as white students. Now, before I reveal the statistic, you might see that I'm interchanging BME with BAME, and I'm deliberately doing that, folks, because You'll have heard of labels and there's lots of talk within um, scholarship around race that we should be dropping the terminology of BAME and BME. And I, I remember a discussion I had with Professor Rowena Arshad and she said, let's not get caught up with the terminology here. Let's start to talk about those underlying issues first and foremost. Um, and so I'm just introducing terms that you will see being used interchangeably, black and minority ethnic BME, black Asian minority ethnic BAME. Um, so just, just to clarify there for you. So 45.5% agreed that the teachers did encourage them as much as their fellow white peers. That's really positive in that sense. But we also have a small percentage that strongly disagreed with that comment. And that was mostly from the secondary school young people who were saying that they actually felt that there was a difference there, that their fellow peers um, who were not from a, a, a background of... Um, BME background were not as encouraged as their fellow peers, so something important to think about. Teachers at my school denied that people from a BME background faced extra obstacles, right? So this is huge for young people who are growing up um, experiencing racism on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think folks, this is something really important for us to understand that racism exists. It's in our everyday and we need to begin to think about how when we are in school or even in terms of our own minds, how does race enact in those spaces and how do we begin to think about challenging um, uh, the discourse here? So 40.3% of young people agreed that their teachers were almost in denial that no, no, you don't face any extra obstacles, you know, it's all in your head or perhaps you're being overly sensitive about that issue. Um, and, and again, we're seeing a rather large statistic there. This one's really important for me because when things go wrong and we're reporting racism or a young person is attempting to go to their class teacher and say, I'm not happy, something has upset me. And here's the thing, this is what's happened. But when we've got young people saying that teachers at my school were knowledgeable about the processes that were required to follow if a racist incident happened at school, 51.3% strongly disagreed. So what they're saying is effectively 50% of our teachers do not know about the processes in, in uh, following up a racist incident in school. Um, and that's not a good place to be. Um, we really need to be aware of how, uh, first of all, we listen and hear and how we begin to then support and begin to address these issues uh, within uh, our schools. 
This one here, if I experienced a racist incident at my school, I would feel able to tell my teacher. Okay, so again, that approaching the, the, the teacher that you really um, feel that you should be going to, 29.5% strongly disagreed that they felt they couldn't approach their teacher. Um, and again, we need to think about why. Why is that the case? Um, is it because of that initial denial of any obstacles um, or just the lack of response? Again, in culture and inclusion, teachers and staff at my school did not understand my culture, heritage or background. So that's essentially about you. That's essentially about someone's very identity, their sense of self. 70% of young children strongly agreed that the, the teachers and staff in their school didn't really know them very well. Yeah, and I think, you know, as teachers, we, we I, I think it impacts on our planning, our, our very planning and designing of lesson plans, of next steps, where do we want to go next with the young people? If we don't know them, then what we're producing, is, I would question, is it fit for purpose? Other pupils at my school did not understand my culture, heritage or background. So this is their friends. This is their peer group that they are growing up with. So if in primary, next seven years of their life in primary school with the same peers along, alongside them, um, and they were saying 69.2% strongly agreed that even their, their friends really did not know. And you know, a point to make here, folks, is I've often heard colleagues say, you know, I feel really fortunate that my children are growing up with a diverse set of friends because it will give them a chance to walk in their shoes yeah. And I'm always saying that to colleagues as well, and not just within a sort of schooling um, aspect. I was chairing um, and leading the project for universities and colleges in response to the EHRC report, looking at tackling race, racial harassment within our campuses. And in that, talking to colleagues and saying, if you, if you don't know colleagues from a BAME background, if you don't know anybody at all in your own social circle, start to, 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 to know and network because you'll get a feel for what that is like. You'll get a feel for some of those experiences. You'll get to hear what those obstacles, challenges, barriers, the day-to-day -day experiences that they have because that will really help you to begin to understand um, how racism manifests. Um, and so again, so that was, a, that was a perspective we got from young people. So quite powerful for them to say things like, I don't see myself being reflected. My teachers perhaps might not be able to support me. I might not go to them if I experience racism in school. So worrying um, statistics here. But now I want to share with you very briefly some comments from teachers. All right, so are we living really in a post-racial era is probably a question we want to have in our minds. And I think clearly from the, the young people's responses, I know what my response is here, but let's think about what our teachers are saying. So again, very generic. I, I'm not wanting to make sweeping generalizations here. This was a sample of some teachers in Scotland that I had uh, conducted some interviews. It was a focus group where I asked the question about, would you talk to young people about race? or how confident are they in talking about race? And one of the teachers said, race is name calling, Khadija is nothing special. Everyone gets called names, you know? And, and I, I had to try to remain quite partial, but at the same time, I was becoming quite shocked at some of the comments that were coming through. And, and that's another big problem, folks. When we talk about reporting and supporting racist incidents, if we ourselves as teachers, as educators, will say to young people, it's nothing, it's not a big deal, get over it. Everybody gets called names. Then essentially we are denying and dismissing those very traumatic experiences that they face on a day-to-day -day basis because of the color of their skin. And I would go further than saying that it's um, bullying and racism Two, very two different things that we need to be thinking about. So talking about race just puts ideas in people's heads. So again, right, let's not talk about it. Let's just sweep it under the carpet. Not sure if I want to engage. Could that be because you're afraid of what might the young people say? And if so, then that means you need to be 10 steps ahead um, and begin to think about your own understanding of it. 
or is it perhaps you're coming from a very positive intention that let's just not talk about it because I don't think it really exists. I don't know enough about other cultures, so I steer clear. And again, I understand that, that sense of nervousness that comes through. I don't know enough, so I don't want to offend. I don't, and maybe that fear of no political correctness oftentimes can you know, be, be held to account here where folk just don't want to say the wrong thing. But that doesn't mean we, we, we don't do anything about it. Um, this particular comment was from, if I remember clearly, um, it was from a, a, a teacher from the secondary sector. Um, I'm not a racist, but some cultures should adapt more. And again, um, I think we need to think about this really carefully, folks, and you'll have heard of lots of comments. We've had a very strange year this past year, and then in the summer, we had, um, obviously, we, we heard of the killing of George Floyd. We had the resurgence of the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and we had lots of discussions where folk were talking about Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. And there was lots of different sort of Twitter wars going on at that time. What we need to understand, folks, it's not good enough anymore to say, I'm not a racist. Actually, we need to be saying, I'm an anti-racist practitioner, I'm an anti-racist teacher. Right. And oftentimes what happens is we associate racism with a particular individual who we perhaps associate as being bad. The only bad people commit racist incidents. But actually what we're looking at here is that systemic nature of racism, the, the sort of institutional aspect of it in terms of policy, in terms of curriculum and so on as well. Um, so again, I'm not racist, but some cultures should adapt more. And is that perhaps talking to that older model of multiculturalism that I blame folks, you know, the steel bands, sa saris and samosas, where uh, folk from diverse communities were perhaps encouraged to assimilate and integrate into the majority culture. And actually what we're arguing for is here, um, it, it's not about that. It's about um, uh, acknowledging, nurturing, uh, respecting the diverse cultures that we do have. You also have people who get quite defensive. Um, and again, I understand that when a topic is quite uncomfortable for you and you start to think, I have not had to, I have, not had to have these discussions before Khadija. And I had one teacher say to me, oh, do you know, Khadija, I'm really tired of this. I'm sick of people throwing it in my face. The question was around decolonizing the curriculum and coloniality because somebody had made a comment about well, we need to understand the roots. Where did racism come from? And if race is a contested term, and we talk about one human race, you know, why are we here today? And a, a, a particular individual got quite defensive and, and started to make these comments. Um, and so again, that was some of the reactions that we had. I also asked about ethnicity. I'm often always asked about that. Every time I have to complete a form, I'm asked to disclose my ethnicity as you all are. But I remember as I was growing up, I used to have to create my own box because I felt as if I wasn't fitting into this, you know, the boxes that I had available to me. Um, and again, that was me just thinking about my identity of being born and brought up in Scotland, um, but sometimes being told to go back to where I came from or asking for, you know, where are you really from? And I would say, oh, I'm from the south side of Glasgow. No, 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 where are you really from, Khadija? You know, and so that was really interesting. And when I asked fellow teachers about their ethnicity, a couple of them said, oh gosh, no, I, I'm don't, I don't have an ethnicity, Khadija, I'm white. So, so that was really um, fascinating for me to think about. And, and we had to unpack that later on to say, right, okay, so if you see yourself as white, you don't have an ethnic identity. So those who are, or those who do have, are seen as the others um, and perhaps not normal. Um, so again, let's think about that carefully. I don't see anyone's color. And I think that the teachers that I spoke to who made this comment, because there was quite a few, was really much about coming from that well-intentioned space, yeah? Um, in the sense that, well, actually, Khadija, I don't see anyone's colour. When they're in my classroom, I treat all young people the same. And I think, folks, the argument here is we need to, to disrupt this myth of sameness uh, because we are not the same. Every single one of us are different in many different ways. So we need to think about that again, acknowledging, um, nurturing, 
and celebrating the diverse identities of all our young people because sameness isn't equality, sameness isn't equity. So, so we need to think about that. Um, and this particular one that I got from a number of teachers was, um, Khadija, this conversation is making me feel really uneasy. I've never had to think about the colour of my skin because I just, I just threw it out there and said, we're talking about race, we're talking about racism. Have you had discussions around whiteness? But it wasn't whiteness as an individual person that was there in the focus group. It was about whiteness as a social construct, about everything that we, we are about in our schools is coming from that, um, that dynamic. And I actually had to then say that, well, I have to navigate the color of my skin on a day-to-day -day basis. I could be walking down the street or, or driving along the street, the road, and I will have somebody make some kind of gesture as they're driving past, or I'll be walking in my local park and have somebody say something about my appearance. And so it's something that I'm having to navigate. And I live with that every day and, and the discomfort and the, the, the sort of trauma that that comes with that. And we need to be mindful that many of our young people also experience that folks. So the importance here is to remember that the assumptions that we make are, 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 are something that we have to be very clear out. Are we being complacent and we think, oh, this isn't a problem. There's no problem in Scotland at all. And we all get along really nicely. So thanks very much, Khadija. Let's not have this conversation. Or is there that sense of nervousness um, that you need to find out more or you don't know, you don't need an, you don't know enough about this area? But there's also that aspect that worries me perhaps the most folks. It's this unwillingness to examine one's own attitude. And I I've come across a number of practitioners who display. Um, those kinds of attitudes um, and they're quite concerning and, and again so it kind of almost blew that out of the water for me where I felt that no teacher could cause harm in this area but when we hear what the young people are telling us and what we're, we're seeing what some of our teachers have said about their own understanding of race and racism we do have to think about that um, really carefully moving forward. Just also another comment here, uh, if we do think that it's not a problem, folks, these are incidents that have happened in 2021. Thousands of racist incidents reported in Scottish schools. So I think that was a report that was done by the Scottish Liberal Democrats that 2,200 um, reports uh, of racism were recorded in our schools in Scotland. And actually, it was interesting because the, the BBC approached me to say, could you do a short interview on this, Khadija? And what are your thoughts about this? And I said, well, actually, my first thought is that's a very low number. And in fact, I think it just goes to show how underreported it is, because I, I would believe the statistic to be much higher. And if we go by what our young people have said, that their teachers, perhaps in the main, are not knowledgeable about that reporting and supporting, then that would be correct. Also, Edinburgh Council bosses apologise over the sort of claims that have been made where young people were called monkeys and slaves. There was also another incident uh, in response to the whole decolonising the curriculum where a, a teacher in an Edinburgh school, I think, again, trying to perhaps be well-intentioned, um, went on to deliver a lesson around um, slavery. And there were some uh, young um, people of colour in her class and she put them into the group they were doing a sort of dramatization so it was a group of young people who were going to be the oppressed group so the slaves um, and this young person said you know miss i'm really feeling uncomfortable can, can we stop doing this and um, the teacher didn't respond positively and persevered with the lesson and leaving this young person extremely traumatized and the reason why I raise that, folks, is because, again, we will find that we will have toolkits. We will find that we'll have resource packs within schools to say, ah, here you go, as a student teacher, there's a pack on discussing racism, right? That pack is no use to you at all if you do not have that nuanced understanding of race and racism and how it manifests. Because what you will then do is what that Edinburgh teacher did is you will be placing yourself in a really vulnerable situation where you might reinforce negative stereotypes. You might absolutely reinforce the deficit approach 
to the conversations around slavery and colonialism and so on. So it's so, un so important that we have that understanding. So it's things that we can do to help ourselves now and begin to understand uh, the, the, the discourse um, in this. And so that's why I, mean, I have this let's take stock. And, and honestly, I'm not just trying to promote something that I've written here, but it was just the two things that came up in my mind that I think you might find as easy reads. Uh, I did a, a short opinion piece for the Teaching Scotland magazine called The Conspiracy of Silence. And that was um, in response to a report that we had produced as part of the diversity of the teaching profession. I think it was in January 2019, folks, I can't be sure, but if you've got your login details, you will be able to find it in the GTCS website. And I talked there about, you know, when you, when you remain silent, and if you see a racist incident happening, or you're, you know, you're, you're experiencing other staff members talking about things that you think are inappropriate, then, you know, many of us might stay quiet and, and remain silent. But actually what happens is you become complicit within that silence. You are a group of student teachers, so I totally appreciate that you're thinking, Khadija, if I'm in my student teacher placement, I am certainly not going to be bold enough to call out and I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to do is thinking about that calling in and I'll come to that slide in a moment. And just even for yourself to take note and say, hey, actually, how will I deal with that from a personal and professional self? Um, so that that doesn't happen again, or that I am in a position to be able to respectfully and professionally challenge my fellow colleagues, because that is also a responsibility on us all. So let's not become complicit. The other one was the Runnymede Trust is one of the UK's largest think tanks on race equality. And um, as part of Glasgow University, we did an event called Taking Stock, Race Equality in Scotland. And uh, Professor Nasser really invited me to write a short piece for this in which the title was Conversations About Racism and Whiteness Are Missing. And I think we're too afraid to talk about whiteness within, within teaching, within teacher education, and, and how that impacts on us, but how that actually helps to develop our own professional identities. I think we need to have more of what does it mean to be and become a teacher in Scotland. Um, so please do um, look out for those and, and, and see if you can have a, a moment to read so just uh, to take a short breath, take a moment to reflect, just think about this as I go through the, the following slides again. What does this mean for you as a student teacher, as a teacher, as a student teacher? How does this link to your personal and professional values? In your programme so far or in your, your, your experience of initial teacher education or on placement, you've been on placements, and I know this year has been a tricky year for many of you. Some of you have not had a chance to go out in placement. But have you experienced anything that you have felt uncomfortable about? So think about that from a personal and professional perspective. And also think about the conversation we're having this afternoon in terms of how it's beginning to extend your, your thoughts around social justice and, and the whole race agenda. And just to try and put it into context, because folk, folk will often say to me, Khadija, why do I need to bother about this? Yeah. And, and it's so important because it's linked to that idea of be, being and becoming a teacher. And I thought I would present this idea of rhetoric versus reality. We always have the legislation to say, yep, you know, we had the Equality Act come in 2010. And in that, we've got our nine protected characteristics of which race is one. And I'm always arguing, folks, that race is one that very often falls off the agenda or it will have the graveyard slot on any school agenda and we need to think about that really carefully but what happened then was in order to bring race back into the focus the race equality framework 2016 to 2030 um, was, was came about and in that section four under education there's a, a section that says all Scotland's educators need to be interculturally competent and Actually, there's not really much that tells them how to go about doing that. So that's why I was asking that question. What does intercultural competence mean and look like? Yeah. And if we are talking about race, oftentimes I'll have had, I've had, I've been speaking to head teachers about this. And sometimes I'm asked, well, Khadija, I mean, yes, race is an issue. But, you know, where I work, white working class young people face many disadvantages. Yeah. 
And so I get the working class uh, uh, agenda um, thrown back at me, or I'll have the additional support needs agenda or the gender agenda, all of that. And I'll say, absolutely, I'm not saying that those don't matter. What I'm saying is, I actually need to think about the intersectionality here. How does race intersect with other protected characteristics? And that's really important for us to think about. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. So for myself as a woman, um, and so we know within the sort of feminist debates and so on, that perhaps being a woman, you are disadvantaged in terms of promotion or pay skills or whatever. And then on top of that, I'm a woman of color. So that adds to another layer of my disadvantage. And then because I am visibly a Muslim because I wear a hijab, um, that's another layer that's added in terms of disadvantage. And Kimberly Crenshaw is the, the scholar who coined this term. And I would really advise you to go and look at some of her TED Talks, a fantastic scholar, um, Kimberly Crenshaw. So, so have a think about that. In terms of the GTCS folks, as um, I, I've had a really exciting year, I was um, uh, nominated as a vice convener of the General Teaching Council in Scotland and, uh, and really pleased to be in that position because I'm able to challenge colleagues in looking at our professional standards and thinking about where does social justice and diversity lie within our standards, those refreshed and restructured standards which will be enacted from August 2021 something that you will need to be thinking about as well. And we also have within the GTCS this new equality and diversity hub that's been created, excuse me, there's a wee typo there, um, and then two new modules that have been, I think, in conjunction with the University of Dundee. And they're very generic. They kind of introduce you to the whole sort of EDI um, uh, context, but there's also a professional guide. But my question is, folks, we have this information but do we really have, do I see from what the young people are telling us, from what some of our teachers are telling us, do we really have social justice at the heart of everything we do? Um, are we, do we have educators who are reflecting on their understanding of equality and diversity? And do they actually think about what that looks like within their classrooms? And so here's the thing, this is a, this is a really important aspect of what you can do to help yourself. And, and it's, and I've taken this from, you know, kind of American studies on, on race, turning the gaze. You know, you often hear of people saying we need to call out any kind of ism. So if we're calling out racism, I really like that view of calling it in. And when you're calling it in, you're really turning that gaze to yourself. That's, that's so important, self-reflection, where you begin to say, you know, um, what is my own understanding of race and racism and whiteness? How confident do I feel about that? How well do I know myself in terms of, of, of this particular area? And, and so understanding yourself and how you became to be who you are. And so I love this quote that I often use when you know we're saying to, about young people, when I do not know myself, I cannot know who my students are. And when I can't see them clearly, I cannot teach them well. So this is about you eh, getting to know yourself first. Right, and how your identity, the multiple repertoires to your identity are formed. And then think about it from our young people's perspectives. Do we see all aspects of their identity? Do we see that they, they have a different color of skin? Do we see that their cultural practices might be very different from when they're at home and when they're in school? Do we see that or appreciate that they might speak a different first language at home? Yeah. And then when they come to school, they're switching to English. And that sometimes has an impact on their assessments as well, because they might have a really good word in their first language, but they can't find the English equivalent. And so therefore they use the most generic or boring, as I would say, term. And so therefore, when you come to assess it, you think, oh, you haven't used any buzzwords. And so therefore we begin to think about their competency and their levels of ability. But actually, if we think about allowing them to use that first language to help them to think, or, or we allow them to bring in those lived experiences and relate that to what they're doing even better, then assessment is authentic and it's valid. Um, and it's a valid assessment of their ability. 
So here I come to this racially literate teachers, folks. It is absolutely our own responsibility to become racially literate. And I've been speaking to, you know, vice chancellors of universities, so senior white leaders and saying to them, you first of all need to develop your own understanding. So a language with which to name, frame, and begin to then understand and address the issues of race and racism. And only then are you able to begin to deconstruct, you know, your own identity in a sense and think, how am I better positioned to now think about why would my, why would the curriculum as it currently stands or my teaching approach, right? So it's not just about the curriculum, it's about, so what is taught, but how it is taught might not work for some children. And so we need to think about that really carefully. Um, and that responsibility is on us in terms of our, our own professional reading and discussions that we have. Today won't give us enough time, folks, to talk about these terms, but I've included to you just a very brief race glossary, as I've called it. These are terms that you need to become familiar with, be comfortable with, and, and, and it will really help you to, to, to think about the, the discussions here. So race being a contested term, you know, what do we know about that? What do we know what racism is? Whiteness? What, when we talk about privilege and power, how does that manifest? How does that link to whiteness? Uh, white fragility, we have uh, Robin DiAngelo, uh, a, a white scholar also talks about this, uh, lots of YouTube clips around that folks, and I would urge you to watch them. And again, a typical example of that is where oftentimes I remember one experience um, a fellow teacher had with um, an, another teacher saying, actually, you can't say that because, and it was a, a example I'll draw from, which is probably not the best of examples, but we all were aware of Harry and Meghan's, you know, um, interview that was very recent. And um, everybody talked about this race revelation that was coming to the fore. Well, can you believe that conversation took place in a staff room, in a school staff room recently? with some staff saying, my goodness, did you watch the interview last night? Wasn't Meghan Markle playing the race card? Now, I'm not talking about those two individuals themselves. I'm talking about this notion of the race card. So if somebody raises, raises an issue about racism or a young child says, I think I'm being racially abused, they're not playing the race card, folks. There is no card to be played here. What we need to deal with is that fragility, is that suddenly someone accuses somebody of um, um, being racist in any way, that sense of uncomfortableness comes to the surface and the barriers go up and we want, don't want to have that conversation and that's that fragility. And you say, oh my goodness, I can't believe I don't have a racist bone in my body, Khadija, how could you possibly suggest that? So that's the fragility that we're asking you to think about and become and, and learn what that means. Microaggressions. Uh, we produced a great video around that for the project I did for the universities with statements that are often made that we, we make sometimes without even thinking about it. And every single one of us folks have implicit bias. And, and I'm very averse to unconscious bias training folks. And I think it's a get out clause to be honest. And I think it puts the emphasis on the perpetrator rather than the victim. And so we need to get familiar with the language of microaggressions and, and, and learn more about that. And certainly I can point you in the right direction of reading. In terms of the discussion around race, racism and colonialism, there's a fantastic book by Angela Saini. Um, um, it's a book called Superior, The Return of Race Science. It's a journalist talking about her experience, which is great. But this notion of culture responsive pedagogy folks and actually from where I'm coming from you can call it an anti-racist pedagogy, a socially just pedagogy, a culture responsive pedagogy and Gloria Lanson Billings again another American race scholar coined this term and that's really some, some of the things I've already discussed with you that bringing in languages into a classroom allowing our young people to use their first language in the classroom even though you might not understand what that is right and you're trusting them, you're, you're placing that trust that they're bringing it in to help them. You're allowing them to code switch between their languages. You're, you're understanding their culture, you're getting to know them. You're getting to know their family members, so their mum and dad, their carers, because 
talking to them, inviting them into your classroom spaces, particularly in primary. I know it's difficult in secondary, but there are other ways that we can engage families within that scope as well. How do you as a teacher get familiar with the community that your school sits within? Right. So are there any community learning schools on a Saturday morning? And I remember having a, a young Cantonese speaker in my school many, many years ago in my class. She was always very shy, extremely bright young girl. And I remember once after parents night, she just skipped along the corridor speaking to her dad in Cantonese. And that really hit home to me that, my goodness, Khadija, did you ever let her speak Cantonese or promote it in the classroom? And I didn't. Um, and so I remember visiting her in her Saturday morning class, just it was a 10 minute road trip over, just to see a, a very different child in action, bubbly, leading the discussions. And I thought, oh, I've missed a trick here. And I remember thinking, how do I now begin to think about using that in my classroom? So some really important things about bringing culture in. And this slide really just talks to you about you know, teacher leadership. And as, even as students, you are leaders of learning, folks. You're, you're, you're on that journey. So think about when we talk about values and commitment, learning and teaching, how we communicate with our young people, their families, our fellow colleagues. And I'm also going to throw in the caveat of your teachers of colour. So your fellow colleagues who, who are from a black and minority ethnic background too. The group that I've mentioned earlier, the diversity teaching group, this is the Scottish government looking at how do we diversify our workforce. But the argument I always bring is we need to look at how our current teachers of colour exist in the workforce because they talk about the racism they experience, sometimes from the young people, but believe it or not, mostly from their fellow colleagues. Yeah, so we need to think about that in all the actions that we do. So that communication, that collaboration with all our colleagues is really important. And just to come to the finish there, my, as you can hear, my timer went off, so I'm just a couple of minutes over time. Um, and I'll, I'll just finish off shortly. Folks, what I'm asking you to do is a really difficult task. And uh, Nado Aveling top, is a white academic in the States, and she says that when we ask um, our, our, our white teachers, our white students just to interrogate their own racialized, gendered and class-based positioning, it's a difficult task. And it's almost akin to hacking at our very roots. So I understand that the discomfort will be there, the vulnerability will be there, but it's perhaps nowhere in the scale of what young people are experiencing when they experience a racist incident. So just spare that moment. So, please begin to examine how whiteness functions within our school policies. Do we have a race statement in our schools or we're relying on the local authority policy? Do we have a bilingual learners statement in our school? How can we begin to develop those partnerships with our parents? Walk the talk, develop that anti-racist consciousness through listening to the counter narratives. And those counter narratives are around listening to what our young people are telling us. How about getting them to team teach? They come with cultural wealth you don't need to reinvent the wheel, learn from our young people what it's like to be, you know, from a different cultural background or different faith background, you know. Um, I remember once my daughter saying to my teacher, said, you, could you, you know, you know uh, we celebrate Christmas because that celebrates Jesus's birthday. Muslims celebrate Eid because it's Prophet Muhammad's birthday. And my daughter put her hand on her hip and said, sure, mum, that was wrong. I said, that's wrong. Did you, did you tell your teacher that? And she, she said, oh, you try telling her. And so that's our young people saying that she didn't feel comfortable telling her teacher, you've got that wrong, by the way. But actually, it was a missed opportunity. As a teacher, thinking about the young people in your class, how do we involve them in planning with our lessons and so on? So folks, let's move beyond that discomfort. Let's move beyond that guilt and start to think about what it means to become a, a, an effective white ally. And just very quickly, Daryl brings his quote here, talks about allies are individuals who belong to that dominant social group. So actually what you can use is your power and privilege to be able to work and support uh, with your colleagues of color, with the young people that you are, you, you are supporting in order to challenge um, and, and address prejudicial practices within our workplaces. So this pedagogy of justice is so important. Create those safe spaces, make explicit the added value that our young people bring and your fellow colleagues of color. And that calling in, you know, because calling out sometimes can be seen as somebody being quite, you know, um, um, 
often aggressive, they're actually saying, well, do you know what you've just said there's inappropriate, let's have a chat about that. Um, and I'm going to end there because I think it's really important. I want to create space just to get some observations uh, and comments from yourself. Maybe something for you to think about. What, what have your experiences been in and around race equality? Are those conversations taking place within schools that you have been visiting as student teachers? And um, I will stop sharing there, uh, Stephen. And just to finish off, I think just to put it into context, I'm going to read you out just a very short quote about how important it is for us to get our young people's names correct, particularly if they come from a diverse cultural background. Let's not make it up. Let's not call them something else. It's so important because it's a marker of their identity. So when we chose our daughter's names, we wanted to give them something that they could carry with them, something that they could use as strength, as home, in a world that might not always nurture them as we would want it to. We gave them names that were hundreds of years old, that carried with them the prayers of their great grandmothers, names that represented their own spirits, but that also manifested the spirit of their people. We gave them news, sorry, we gave them names that we knew would be a challenge at times, and that might even feel like a burden when they just want to blend in. But we needed them to know that they come from somewhere and that this is their strength, their power, and the representation of our own hope for their futures and for those of the children they will someday have. And I'll stop there, Stephen. Deja, thank you very much. You gave us an awful lot to think about from the, the language, the, the constructs, all the different Im implicit things we don't really question. So you've re really given us a lot of scope to think about. Stephen, I'll hand over to you for the chat. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've got a couple of things. Here's, here's a very quick one, Khadija, to begin with. Uh, and thank you for that, that extraordinary um, uh, presentation. Can you share the video you made on microaggressions? Oh, absolutely. Um, actually, it's, it's so easy to get, Stephen. It's in the Advanced HE website. In fact, I'll, I'll do it while, while you get the next question. I can Great. find Great. the link and share with you. That's perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Um, we've got another another um, question that came in very early and it, you've kind of half answered this, but I think it'd be quite useful to maybe talk about it again. Um, how would you how would you go about having this conversation um, with other adults who make comments? And the person said, and I'm not going to use names because we're recording. That's my biggest worry about these conversations to date. Um, I've had one friend, not a teacher and not exposed to many cultures, declare that her new neighbour was an alien and a former colleague complained about ESL pupils using their first language in the classroom, um, an MFL classroom, um, they might add. So it's about how do you go about having the, you know, and I think it's maybe building your calling in rather than calling out. Yeah, I, I would agree, Stephen. And, and again, um, very sensitive conversations, but it's also about that responsibility on you to say, don't let it go. Right, so, so you challenge it, but you'll find a way to challenge it if it's your friend or if it's a colleague. Um, and it's probably about saying, well, actually, I and be confident in saying, I disagree with the comments you have made um, and, and, and be strong enough and be bold enough to say that. And, and then be able to say that actually I have, perhaps you might be able to draw on some friends that, or peers that you do have or colleagues that you work with, or perhaps they actually have read a really good book that you might find helpful to read. Um, and start with those easy reads, I guess. And I get that's perhaps one way of opening it up. Um, because at first, what you might get is that defensive, you know, that, that kind of wall that comes up straight away and you don't want to engage. Um, and you don't want to then press on that too much because otherwise they'll just not want to cross that, that border at all. So gently, I would sort of prompt them with perhaps some lived examples that you bring of those counter narratives. Um, or perhaps encourage them to read a book that you've read and you found really helpful. That might start them off. But in terms of colleagues, I think it's much, probably easier, I think, Stephen, because it's a professional dialogue you could be having. You could be presenting those statistics to them and saying, what do you think of that? What's that telling us? Or let's go to the GTCS professional standards. My goodness, standards that we as teachers are measured against. Absolutely. Now I've got another one that's, that's, that's a tricky one again, Khadija. How do we engage with BAME colleagues in conversations about race? Uh, leaning into the discomfort, I wouldn't know how to appropriately bring it up, but wouldn't like to miss the opportunity to learn something. 
Okay, very good question. Um, and actually a, a really interesting question because it's often the other way around when BAME colleagues will say, how do I start having that conversation with my white colleagues? Now to understand that, um, and I would actually urge you to read, please do all of you if you can, um, read uh, Rowena Arshad's report. Um, it's called, it's three years on from our project. So it's a final report for diversity in the teaching profession. Um, and in that, BAME teachers are talking about their experiences of being in schools in Scotland. So from being a student teacher who experienced racism from their class teacher to a more experienced teacher looking for promotion and not getting it. And it was all because of all the things that were going on. And so they're often asking who's having those conversations. But for you, if you have a BAME colleague, actually getting to know your BAME colleague, you know, that's really important, spending time chatting with them. Um, because they will bring with them that counter narrative. They will bring those stories about what happened at home at the weekend, you know, or cultural experiences that are engaged. And I used to always talk about Ramadan and I'd go upstairs as a P7 teacher. I used to get out early because all my kids were, you know, um, in the playground monitoring and I'd go up to put the kettle on for coffee, even though I was fasting. And I'd go, why are you doing that? You're fasting. I thought, I know, but then it's, you're also having to have coffee. Having those conversations about feeling hungry, feeling tired, or just you know anything that's going on at home helps them to learn. I even shared with them experiences that I had of racism. As much as reliving that can be quite traumatic, I thought it was important for my colleagues to hear that because it becomes very real because it's somebody they know. And when you hear about those things, it makes it easier to talk about some of the, the, the challenges they face. And so you mentioning them or you actually raising something, saying, I saw that headline in the paper, 2,200 racist incidents, that's ridiculous. What do you think we could do? What's your experience? How do you feel about that? How do you think we're tackling it? Involve them in conversations, listen to what they are saying, because oftentimes they feel that they're minoritized, both but physically and verbally. There are two, two questions. I think we'll probably come near the end. Um, I'll leave the, 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 the last one for you. But there's a couple of questions of pretty much the same thing about the sensitivities around asking pupils to become the, 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 the co-teacher and, yep. and not wanting to make them feel as if they're being singled out. Yep. I, I, get this, I get asked this all the time, Stephen. Um, so I'm so glad you did ask. And it's always a worry for folk to say, well, I don't want to single out the only... Um, you know, child from a, a black and white background in my classroom. And that's true. You don't want to single them out. And so here's the thing. This is where, A, as a teacher, you really get to know them well, right? And it's through having that chat about how did you get on and what you're up to and so on. But also, actually, is, is, is speaking to the young people before you actually plan a lesson. So thinking ahead, what sorts of things are you planning for the next term? Actually, let me see who in my classroom, it doesn't have to be children from a BME background, because it could be any other topic you're doing, and saying, right, what young people can I draw on? What cultural wealth can I capitalise on as a teacher and involve them in it? And so you say to them, I'm going to be talking about, so let's just say it was it was Ramadan. Um, would you be interested in, in sharing some of your experiences? Or would you rather I did it from a very different perspective? We used a story as a stimulus or as a provocation for those discussions. Or will you be prepared to be in the hot seat that we often do with our drama and so on? So have that sensitive conversation with your young people, first of all. If they're happy to do it, go for it. If they're not, then you appreciate that and you find other ways to come in and involve them. And once they feel comfortable that they can trust their teacher to navigate those spaces in a respectful way, you'll find that they'll want to contribute. And, and, and be that, um, and be in the hot seat more. Brilliant, and the final, I think probably the final question, Angela, because we're running out of time. Yep. Um, wow, how should I deal with a racist incident in my classroom? <laughs> Great, I, I love it, love it. Thank you so much for asking these questions. So, I mean, obviously as a student teacher, so I'm thinking now, what would I say if it was my student going out into a placement and they, they got in touch with me as their tutor? Now. I would be absolutely saying, because student teachers, you, you're very careful, aren't you? you? You're always accused of overstepping the mark or whatever. So my, your first point of contact would be to go to your class teacher and, and say, actually, a young person has come to me. And you know that we never promise young people that we won't share something, because that's all in the top child protection aspect as well. So you need to go to the class teacher and say, this 
has been um, disclosed, or perhaps maybe it's not been disclosed, but it's happened in a classroom you know, overtly, how do you deal with it? I think you absolutely need to stay there and then. So if it, if it was the incident that happened in front of all the young people, somebody makes a derogatory comment, I think we actually have to say that is not an appropriate thing to say, right? Um, and we can then, and I would leave, actually at that point, I would leave it at that. And I would then touch base with that young child later, because I also don't want to put that young person on the spot either, because they've probably acquired that from what they've heard on social media, at home, in the street. And so we're not, remember, we're not talking about the child per se, it's the behaviours, isn't it? So I would want to maybe give them the safe space for them to be able to say, where did they, that comment come from? And I would find other ways to challenge it. So I would perhaps bring in some headlines. I would perhaps put a collage of pictures of people from diverse cultural backgrounds to start those conversations about diversity and difference. And perhaps have a classroom text that we build our discussions around. So you do it in a very subtle form. Older children, you can tackle it head on, yeah? And you can begin to see why that was inappropriate. Um, and that's really important, but we must not brush it under the carpet and we must not stay silent on those issues. That's absolutely brilliant, thank you so much. So just, just, just a final comment. Um, the recording will go on the CIRA website, that's the Scottish Educational Research Association, and that's free access, free open access. And yes, it can be shared with all of your, your friends and colleagues. It's not a problem. And remember, it's Scottish Educational Research Association and it will come up and it's a pretty easy website to navigate. Angela. Uh, just to say, Khadija, thank you very much for taking the time this afternoon to talk to us. Stephen, for manning the chat so well. And to everyone, thank you for taking the time and attending this very first CIRA special ITE event. It was terrific to see you engage. It was great to see all the comments coming through and we look forward to welcoming you again, again in the future. So thank you very much and have a safe and healthy Easter. Thank you. Thanks everybody.